So uh, the talk ends up being about 30 minutes, so I thought, uh, given that there are a lot of people here apparently who don't know how lightning works, uh, you can like, ask questions as we go along. Uh, I kind of pitched the talk for people who already know about lightning a bit, so yeah, if you don't, like, feel free to just raise your hand and I'll ask your question. So uh, primarily I'm going to be talking about like who am I and what is the DCI, uh, because we don't really have much of a public profile yet, uh, but we're working on some really interesting things and we'd be really grateful if people would contribute and take part because you know, some of the projects are really quite cool. And I'm going to be recapping payment channel networks, uh, so on a high level, not how they work, but rather what they do. Um, and then comparing some of the existing implementations, uh, including as uh, I notice most people here, so you know. I'll be talking about his implementation briefly. Uh, and then also how we're putting it into practice and the projects we're working on in order to actually get this stuff into people's hands rather than it being just like a command line tool that people like me play with. So who am I? Uh, I'm James Lovejoy. I'm an undergrad, believe it or not. Uh, I'm a junior. People often ask me, are you a postdoc? I say no. So I started mining Bitcoin in like early 2013. Uh, with just the graphics card on my computer. For me, it started uh, as a way of getting pocket money because my parents never gave me that. So I was able to mine a ton of Bitcoins uh, using my parents' electricity bill. Uh, they don't know that, so please don't tell them. I wish I'd kept them, believe me. Uh, yeah, I moved to Litecoin after ASICs became dominant on BTC simply because I wanted something that I could mine for myself. And then when Litecoin got run over by ASICs, I moved to Bitcoin. Uh, which is a coin that tries to be ASIC resistant and has forked in the past in order to remove ASICs for our algorithm from the network. And uh, I created a pool called Green Pool, which was a profit switching multi pool when those were really popular. Um, so that was really my first foray into developing with these things. And I suppose it showed me how much low hanging fruit there is compared to how much money there is in the space. Like there's billions of dollars and arguably less than 100 people actually writing code that does real things. Uh, so yeah, I was, I want to say 15 when I did that. So yeah, I became the Bitcoin lead developer in early 2015. So I've been there ever since. Now I understand this is a Bitcoin devs meetup. So I want to first point out like Bitcoin is really important. Um, you know, primarily because without Bitcoin, coins like Bitcoin, Litecoin just like couldn't exist. Uh, we are completely reliant on the upstream Bitcoin developers. Uh, in order to have any code at all, uh, as are many other coins. And, but you know, the thing is, is we do live in a multi-coin world. Over the last year, the dominance of Bitcoin has been decreasing and now constitutes around 35% of the total market cap. So I think we need to come to terms with the fact that these altcoins are here to stay. Uh, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing, because you know, it's important that we all contribute to the development of Bitcoin directly or indirectly because without Bitcoin, none of this stuff is even able to work. And Arnold's altcoins can help to make it better for everyone. And that's partially what we've been trying to do at Bitcoin at least, uh, is really try and help rather than hinder. So what's the Digital Currency Initiative? We're a research group within the MIT Media Lab. So we work on you know, all things distributed systems and cryptography, so not just blockchain related applications, but also like more low level cryptographic primitives, as well as things that you couldn't really call a blockchain at all, but more you know, distributed systems. And we're a nonprofit funded by the Media Labs 90 member companies. Uh, you can go look those up on, on their website. And we fund two of the core developers, so Corey Fields and Vladimir. <coughs> And we work on a bunch of projects, obviously Bitcoin Core uh, Lit, which is primarily what I'm going to be talking about today, which is a multi-coin payment channel daemon. Uh, Crypto Panel, which is my baby. Uh, it's a distributed ledger toolkit. So the idea is, is it's a C++ library that abstracts away like 95% of the stuff that cryptocurrencies actually do, so that you can define a cryptocurrency in a set of configuration files. So the idea for this is it allows for like really rapid prototyping. Uh, of other cryptocurrencies, whilst allowing people who may not be crypto developers to actually get started and create something that isn't based on Ethereum. Uh, we work on ZK Ledger, which is uh, actually quite an interesting project. It, the idea is to allow banks to contribute uh, information about their balance sheets in zero knowledge, but still allow you to do statistical queries on those balance sheets. 
So you can imagine a situation where you know, 30 banks contribute in zero knowledge their balance sheets and then an auditor is able to go over and determine whether these banks are solvent, um, which is really powerful because the banks don't want to hand over what assets they have and things about their trading strategies. And finally, digital fiat currency. So we're working with a number of central banks to help them think through how they might put a distributed version of their fiat currency into practice, uh, which will be good from an interoperability perspective, I think. So I'm gonna briefly just go over what payment channels do for those who are unclear. So we have Alice and Bob, uh, and they make a two of two multi-sig. They broadcast that to the chain. And they create this temporary state between themselves where one of them, say, starts with one Bitcoin, another starts with zero Bitcoins. And they can then communicate out of band and update their channel states as many times as they like, completely for free, without ever having to broadcast it to the chain. And when they're done, they sign their 2 of 2 multi-sig and broadcast the final channel states to the chain. So this is really great because it means that, you know, you can do lots and lots of transactions without actually having to spend any transaction fees. By extension, you know, if Alice has a Bitcoin channel with Carol, and Carol has a Bitcoin channel with Bob, they can do a multi-hop payment. So Alice pays Carol, and Carol in turn pays Bob. So it means that you don't have to have bilateral channels with absolutely everyone, which is really convenient. By extension, these channels don't actually even have to be on the same coin. So you could be in the situation where you know, Alice has a Bitcoin channel with Carol, and Carol has a Bitcoin channel with Bob, has a Bitcoin channel with Bob, and Alice wants to pay Bitcoin, and Bob wants to receive Bitcoin, and they could do that as long as they're able to come up with a mutually agreeable exchange rate. And even further by extension, we can arguably get rid of custodial exchanges, because if Alice and Bob have Bitcoin and Bitcoin channels, they can just perform a swap. So. Arguably, you don't even need exchanges to hold any coins anymore, which will be really great. So what are the motivations for having these things at all? Uh, it means that you know, we've got this current problem where the fees on Bitcoin are increasing as more people use it. Uh, and it, it really hinders the adoption of the whole system as a whole, because once you know, transaction fees get upwards of $30, as they sort of did, a couple months ago, it really stops people from using it. And you know, we'd like as many people to be using this as possible. On-chain transactions are way too slow for in-person payments. You know, if you're gonna wait waiting for six confirmations, which you should be, that's potentially an hour of time elapsed for you to purchase your copy, which would be really unfortunate. And again, yeah, transaction fees, even if we get them low and the mempool is empty, you know, there's still a couple of dollars and that's too high to be competitive for day-to-day -day transactions, which for most people don't cost anything. And again, we, we have this problem where all the exchanges hold everyone's coins and everyone keeps all their coins on the exchanges. So we're putting a massive amount of structural risk into those exchanges. As we saw with Mt. Gox, we saw it with MintPal, we saw it with Cripsy. You know, these exchanges, we trust them with all of our money and then they lose it all and there's nothing we can do about it. So if we could do exchange without having to give the exchanges our money, that would be really ideal. Unfortunately, there are, there are actually some requirements to support this and a number of coins don't have those requirements. So the first thing you need is a scripting language in your transactions that allows conditional and Boolean logic, by which I mean you need to be able to say if, else, and, and, or. Uh, you need a common hash function, so usually we use SHA-256, but as long as it's the same, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you need time locks, which is check sequence verify in Bitcoin. You need transaction malleability fixes, which is SegWit in Bitcoin. And uh, unfortunately, this precludes actually quite a lot of coins in the top 100, i.e. Dogecoin, Sire, Bitcoin Cash. So either these coins are going to need to change to be part of this system, or they're going to be left by the wayside, I think. So what are the pros and cons of this? Obviously, the best thing, I think, is all the settlement occurs in local state. So most of the time, you're not committing anything to the chain, you're not paying transaction fees, you're not filling up the global state, which is what we wanted. Settlement within channels occurs at the limit of network latency now, rather than block time. And we get decreasing fees to scale, which is really powerful. The more you use it, the cheaper it gets, which is really ideal. But in order to get this, we've traded off the non-interactivity properties of Bitcoin. 
So now the system is both interactive and participatory, uh, by which I mean not only do you have to be online to send and receive a payment, you also have to stay online and watch the transactions that are occurring in the chain in order to potentially defend your channel if something goes wrong, uh, which is highly inconvenient for, I think, most users. Uh, and again, this will probably only be a problem in the early stages at least, but transaction volume is limited by the channel capacity to the person that you're trying to pay. So if you want to pay someone you know, two bitcoins and you only have a channel that has one bitcoin, then you essentially can't make that transaction. And the initial setup can be costly and slow. It's not so much of a problem because it's the same as a non-chain Bitcoin transaction, but that could be a hindrance to some people at least who have this idea that they have to set up a channel which they don't currently have to do. Uh, but yeah, the exciting thing, or at least the most exciting thing for me is, is this graph. So this is the equation for you know, crudely figuring out the cost per transaction for a bilateral channel. And, and as you can see, this is the on-chain fee as it was yesterday on average. And you can see, you know, once you get to 20 transactions, it's effectively only 20 cents per TX. And the more you use the channel, the cheaper it gets, uh, which is the scaling factor we ultimately want when it comes to on-chain fees. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the ultimate thing is it's cheaper than an on-chain transaction as long as you use the channel more than twice. So I drew up this little chart comparing the different payment channel networks that are currently in place. Um, there are others, but these are the ones that currently have code, at least, or code that's publicly available. So I've just put at the top there who's developing it, which coins it supports, whether it has multi-hop or not, uh, whether it has multiple implementations, uh, whether it's developed commercially, i.e. is it a for-profit company that's developing it, and does it have cross-chain swaps. Uh, so I'm going to go over each of these just briefly. So Bolt, this is the C Lightning, Eclair, LND trifecta of implementations. The pros of this, it, it's the only one with multi-hop at the moment, uh, which is the ultimate end state that you want. Uh, it's pretty impractical to expect everyone to make a bilateral channel with everyone else. Uh, they have multiple implementations, which is good, because it means that their specification is stable. Uh, and they have by far the most active development in community projects, um, way outstripping all the others. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, it requires forking upstream code to add new coins, which isn't so bad, but especially in my experience recently with the problems that were on Electrum, where the RPC interface was completely open to people stealing your private keys, uh, there are still lots of coins that are completely vulnerable to that, even though you know, two months have passed since that vulnerability was released, simply because everyone's using forks of upstream wallets uh, rather than each of these wallets supporting multiple coins. So it means that if the developers of those Garus coins just aren't paying attention, you'll probably never get a patch and lots of people will stay vulnerable. So I'd like to avoid that at least as much as possible. This is a con for some people and not others. Uh, at least for me it is. The, the development is commercially led. Uh, each of these implementations are developed by for-profit companies. Um, for some people that's not a problem, for others it is. Uh, and the specification does contain some patented algorithms, which again, may not be a problem for others. And there's Lit, which is the one we work on. Uh, the biggest pro in my eyes is it has this multi-wallet architecture. So Lit supports three different coins at present, Litecoin, Bitcoin, and Bitcoin, uh, all in the same piece of software. Uh, obviously, we're a non-profit, so non-commercial development. But unfortunately, you know, we don't have multi-hop. Uh, there's no protocol specification. It's just the software. Uh, and there's just one implementation. Uh, and very small development team. It's literally just me and Taj that work on this at the moment. So we're looking for more people if you'd like to help out. Uh, there's Radon, which is the sort of Ethereum ERC20 offering. Uh, I guess the only positive would be it's multi-coin amongst ERC20 tokens, but there's no multi-hop, which I suppose makes sense. I don't really know why you need multi-hop for ERC20 tokens. Um, the development is very much commercially led to the point that you need an ICO token to pay for the fees, which I'm not supportive of at all. And then there's Interledger, which is interesting because it's coin implementation and not agnostic and generic, i.e. you can have any coin implemented in there at all. It doesn't even need to be a Bitcoin derivative or support SegWit or any of these things. Uh, they do have multi-hop 
sort of. Um, but to do this, they've made a lot of assumptions about the underlying chains that are being used with this. So it assumes that bank ledgers are of equal esteem to distributed ledgers. Uh, development is led by Ripple. Um, and they have this weird mixture of allowing both payment channels and on-chain payments and centralized settlement as part of a route. So you could be in a situation where one payment is instantaneous and then the next payment takes like an hour because one of the hops was an on-chain payment. So it's kind of strange. So then I guess the big question is like, why do I use lit given that the whole vault specification trifecta is clearly like way ahead of us? Um, the biggest thing for me is the multi-wallet architecture. At least in my experience as an altcoin developer, having to use forked software is a real pain because it's really hard to stay up to speed with the upstream version of the software. I'd much rather if the upstream pieces of software ultimately supported multi-coin on a software level so that vulnerabilities were much easier to patch. We've got remote index synchronization, so you don't need a full node um, to synchronize it, which is really great for like lay people who can't be expected to run full nodes. Uh, the specification is still in flux. This is a good thing for me at least because I think writing a specification should come out of experience using the thing in practice rather than the other way around. So given that no one is really using Lightning Network on a wide scale yet, uh, I think it's quite tough to say we can specify exactly how it should work at this stage. Again, we have this non-commercial development idea. Bitcoin is a non-profit. MIT Media Lab is a non-profit. I'd much rather contribute to a non-commercial project. And we have this concept of it provides one Lightning Network address, and it allows you to pay people uh, in any of the coin types that your lit node supports. So this is really advantageous because lots and lots of altcoins have decided to use exactly the same wallet format. Uh, and what that means is people often send coins for one coin to a different coin's address. And then those coins end up locked up in a way that people are rarely able to recover. So the advantage of this, I suppose, is you can give out one lightning address to someone and then they can pay you in any one of these coins. So it reduces the risk of this happening. So to get to this point, we've had to do a lot of things that I argue we shouldn't have had to have done as like a rank 100 altcoin, but it shows you how few people are actually working on this stuff. So we've got this problem where it's impractical to expect all users to maintain full nodes for the ledgers they're participating on. So if we want a multi-coin Lightning Network implementation, we need, you know, you could potentially be running like 20 different full nodes, which would be ridiculous. Uh, but it's okay, we, we can use a remote index. However, when we started Electromax and Insight API, which are the most popular ones presently, uh, Electromax didn't support SegWit, it has it now, and Insight API still does not. Uh, in fact, if you send a Burp core node and inf block with witness data in it, you can bring it down, so that's a fun exploit for everyone. Again, they have terrible performance. I mean, Bitcoin is really large now and it takes a really long time to index, which sucks from a development perspective because you might make a change and then have to wait a day for the index to sync up again. And Insight and Electrum are written in really slow interpreted languages. And Insight, again, uses these really inefficient algorithms for looking up addresses with lots of unspent outputs to the point that you can just give it addresses that it will never return a response for which is not gonna work if people are getting paid a lot. And at least for Bitcoin, I didn't have time to measure it for Bitcoin, but Electromex takes a few hours to index and Insight takes around 18 hours. Uh, Bitcoin's blockchain is about two gigabytes compared to Bitcoin's 180 something. So you can scale it up to figure out how long it would take to index Bitcoin with these pieces of software. So we wrote a new multi-coin indexer for Bitcoin and its derivatives. Uh, it's written in C++11, and it uses LevelDB as its backend database, and it reads the block files directly from the disk, which is where it gets a large amount of its performance speed up from. And as a result, it indexes Vercoin in about 20 minutes, which is a massive improvement on the current implementations. And irrespective of how many unspent outputs an address has, it will respond in under a second, which is really good. And we have an Insight API wrapper uh, in development for this, so you can use it as a drop-in replacement for Insight. And we've integrated this with Lit already so that you can have instant sync for Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Bitcoin. So you don't need a full node, you can use a remote index and it will sync really fast. And 
there's the GitHub URL for that if you want to check it out. It's in a Docker container, so it's super easy to spin up. I also developed LitPay, which is a multi-coin payment gateway for Lit. Uh, I'll probably demo it at the end of this talk so you can see how it works in practice. And it's just a really simple Angular Express web UI with a backend channel watcher. And it provides channel services with merchants for users. So what I mean by that is you go to a merchant and you say, hey, make a channel with me, and LitPay manages that for you. Uh, and it does all the things that you would expect from a payment gateway. It generates invoices, provides details to the payer, notifies the recipient that they've been paid. And at the moment, because we don't have multi-hop, it's really useful for like recurring in-person Bitcoin payments. And I think also it'd be really useful for exchanges to implement this, because you could foresee a situation where rather than keeping your coins in an exchange, you just make a channel with the exchange, push your coins when you actually want to trade, and then the exchange pushes them back to you. So you're rarely keeping your coins in the exchange for more than the period of time necessary to actually trade them uh, in the order book. And yeah, so that's also on GitHub. You can try it out for yourself. So how does it work? You have a person and a merchant, and they make a channel request with the merchant who gives them some kind of fund ID, which they then associate with the channel to inform the merchant that they've made a channel with them. And when it comes to actually paying, you make an invoice request to the merchant, and say like, hey, I'd like to buy a laptop or something. It gives you back an invoice ID, and then you send that invoice ID with your channel push, and it associates your payment with the product that you're purchasing. So as you can see, you know, really this has become an interactive protocol. And uh, every channel owner needs to stay online and connected to both send and receive payments now. And you have to be online in order to monitor the network to defend your channels if necessary. Uh, we do have a watchtower built into Lit, which allows you to give your justice transactions to other users, but ultimately then you're trusting them that they will actually broadcast these justice transactions in the event of a breach. Uh, so ultimately, if you really want to be secure, you need to be doing this for yourself. Uh, most people, actually, believe it or not, don't leave their computers always online. Who knew? Uh, I've never shut my computer down, but apparently people do that. So interactivity doesn't work so great. And mobile, like, it sucks for mobile because, like, you go through a tunnel, you know, or, you know, you go into the woods or something, go hiking for the weekend, and someone breaches your channel, and, oh, no, your phone wasn't online, and you didn't broadcast the justice transaction. So it, it really doesn't work very well for devices that aren't always connected to the Internet. You could broadcast a transaction from any node, and realistically, no one's going to figure out who it was that broadcasted it. With this, if you're transacting with someone, you know, theoretically, you're leaking your IP addresses and all of your channel balances. So you, know, you could foresee a situation where like, it really increases the risk of real-world theft. Like if I make, make a channel with someone or I pay them, and then I figure out they have like 200 bitcoins or something, I could just find their IP address, go to their house, and like, accost them physically. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. And users have NATs and firewalls, which make it really difficult to connect to other people, which is ultimately what you need to do in order to transact in this system. So at Blockcoin, we developed this project called Litbox, which is essentially a full stack lit solution for a dedicated hardware device. And one of our biggest goals is decentralization. We really don't want a situation where you're paying other people to host Lightning Network nodes for you. We'd much rather everyone to be doing this for themselves uh, so that they can really be in control of their own money. Uh, so it's designed to run on like a really basic hardware device, like a Raspberry Pi. And it contains everything you need to get started. So full nodes, indexes, the lit daemon, and administration panel. And it runs over Tor to get around all of these privacy, NAT, and firewall problems. So by using an overlay network, uh, it doesn't really matter if you have a firewall anymore. Anyone can connect to anyone and you're no longer leaking your IP address in physical location every time you're transacting. And then it provides an authenticated thin client API for pairing mobile and desktop devices to it. So this way, you know, you can imagine it's very similar to a router, right? You leave it in your house, it's on all the time, and then you connect your devices to the router to actually connect to the internet. This is very similar. You run the lit box in your house, you leave it on all the time, you forget that it even exists, but you pair your mobile and desktop devices with it, and then you transact from those, which means you can share the same wallet between all of your devices, and you don't have this problem where if you go away for the weekend, you know, all your channels are potentially at risk. And yeah, the code for that is that it just runs in a big Docker stack, so you can run the whole thing for yourself, all compiled for all. So this is like the basic architecture. 
you run your libbox, you have a desktop and a hardware device, and then you connect each of your physical devices via an RPC like SSH tunnel, and then the libbox is the thing that actually connects to the other lightning nodes, which you would have channels with. And then a lit tracker, which is very similar to a torrent tracker, but for lit nodes. So it allows you to reference lit nodes by only their lit address, without actually having to know their IP addresses ahead of time, which is convenient for people who have changing IP addresses or changing Tor hidden services or whatever. And that means that you can provide a single FAC32 address to all recipients, the same one, and make channels in whatever point type their lit wallet supports. So this is far convenient than what we have now, where we have all different addresses for different recipients, different coin types, some of which overlap, which makes uh, at least an exchange's job really hard. And the code for that is there. So uh, this is the lit network as it stands now. Um, all of these are me. So uh, I'm really lonely on the network. Um, it supports multi-coin, so 65536 is the number for Bitcoin testnet, so these are all Bitcoin testnet channels at the moment, but theoretically it could be Litecoin testnet or Bitcoin testnet or any of the mainnet equivalents of that. And uh, you can make a channel with me. That's my lit address. Please make a channel with me. It'll be really exciting for you. So you can either use my tracker, which I've included there, or you can connect directly using the address there. And I'm accepting channels in testnet Bitcoin or Bitcoin, or if you're feeling really brave, you can use LiveNet Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is too valuable, so I'm not accepting live net Bitcoin just yet. I can't guarantee you'll get your Bitcoins back, so only if you want to lose them, you do that. Uh, yeah, so I'll take questions now, and then also I have a demo of LitPay, which I'll show you guys if you want. Could you guys wait for the mic when you're asking a question? Are there any questions? Um, I, a general question about Lightning Networks is, it seems to me you still have to pay the cost of uh, creating that multi-sig wallet and having the confirmations go through. So you have you know, an hour-ish to do that, which leads to me, me to believe that I won't be setting these up with uh, every version I interact with on a daily basis. It will probably end up being more like someone similar to my bank where I put, you know, 10 Bitcoin in per year, and I just transact like that. Um, is that centralization worth it in order to reduce the fees? Or, and I guess, yeah, where do you see the end game of Lightning Networks going, I guess? So uh, I guess I would agree it could potentially bring centralization if there aren't that many of these gateways who are willing to like provide channels to new users. Uh, but the barrier to entry to being one of these gateways is gonna be so low that you'll have people who will just set up gateways that don't charge any fees and stuff like that. So whilst I agree it could cause centralization, I think the barrier to entry will be so low that there will be so much competition that as a result it won't actually be that centralized. And again, you know, you don't, it's not a consensus protocol ultimately. Like Lightning Network it is an overlay network, so if you're not satisfied, just don't use it. I think that's really like the simple answer. Um, because it's not a thing that everyone has to agree to, you can have multiple different Lightning Networks that work in different ways. You, know, you have people charging different levels of fees. So I think there is that risk, but ultimately it won't play out that way, I don't think. When you were talking about whether you need to run a full node to back up uh, your lit node, you said something about indexing. Can you go into that a little bit? Is that like an SPV protocol? Yeah, so what, what these full nodes essentially do is all they do is like talk to the network and verify transactions ultimately. But what you need on top of that is a way to associate addresses with unspent outputs. So the Bitcoin core software by itself doesn't provide such an index. Um, so if you want to say, hey, like how much money does this address have? You can't currently do that easily. So what the indexes do is they provide that. So they index the chain, they map UTXOs and transactions to addresses, so you can do that kind of look. From like the Insight server? Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. exactly. And Insight is an example of an indexer, so that's what they do. Um, can you talk a little bit about your roadmap to doing multi-hops um, and time frame maybe? Time frame is hard to say. I mean, we, 
don't have enough people, I think the, is the, uh, the ultimate sort of answer to that. Um, it will come as soon as it's ready, I think is the, the only answer I can give you. Uh, but there are multiple people working on it, and all the code is public, so you can see exactly where we're at with it. But I mean, I would hope it would be ready within sort of six months or so. So one of your negatives for lightning was that like uh, you just patented uh, you know techniques. What what pattern is there? So my understanding is the uh, method for like Rusty's method for figuring out um, like the set of like straw chain. I think so. That's not patented, isn't it? No. Yeah. Well, you should change your slide. <laughs> okay. You've had it. The, the other thing I get as well is that like uh, there's like indexers are single point of failure, right? Because they can lie to you. They give you arbitrary information. So like if you have like a Rasp pie and talk to an indexer, well like. You know, if if they if you have a channel with them, they can just like tell you the block didn't come. So no, I, I agree. So the lit box code contains the full nodes as well. So the indexer is just used to provide the data to lit. Uh, so lit doesn't talk to the full node directly; it talks to the indexer, uh, which in turn talks to the full node. So ideally, everyone's running full nodes on this device. Cool. But, I mean, but there's also like black clients you can run. Like we made one, so like you know, so you can do black clients too. No, I agree. Yeah, there are multiple implementations, and you should use all of them. Could you go back to the lit pay diagram? Yeah. Uh, forward. Uh, lit pay or lit box? Oh, I think uh, lit box then. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No question. Ricardo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I can actually show you lit pay in practice. I have it kind of set up here. So yeah, so uh, this is my merchant page, which you can see is really awesome, because uh, I'm selling my awesome product. And I have 0.01 BTC test pay. So uh, I've made a channel with this gateway ahead of time. So uh, I just log into the pay again. So as you can see, it, it makes payments really quick. Uh, and this is obviously without multi-hops, this is bilateral, but it's already useful from a merchant perspective. If there's someone you transact with a lot or you're in exchange, you know, you can already put this into practice and reducing a lot of risk from yourself and also from your end users. And as you can see, it makes payments practical for sort of in-person kinds of things because that took, what, 20 seconds or something. So it's neat. Uh, what modifications would you make to Bolt if you could force that on everybody? Just like your observations. Um, I guess I'd say I don't know enough about the Bolt specification to say seriously what I would change. Um, for me, it's more about the fact that one, obviously, I have access to this being at MIT, so I'm able to contribute like really easily to this. Um, the non-commercial thing is pretty important to me, at least. And also, it was really easy for me to add Vercoin and other coins. So, you know, we had this working on Vercoin mainnet like eight months ago now. So, you have the chart of transaction costs going down with more users. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if, in the beginning, with a low amount of users, the higher transaction cost, is there a way within the protocol to incentivize kind of early adopters of this? Because, in general, people are somewhat slow in adopting some of this uh, new technology. Um, or, or, yeah. Whether it's like a, a staking or... There it is. Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, maybe Lalu has some ideas on this, I'm not sure. Um, I, 
think the key will just be making it really easy for people to use. I mean, if you can make it ergonomic with really good UX, and the transactions actually become instantaneous, which is ultimately what people want, then I think people will simply use it just because it's much better than what we have already. Um, with the lit box uh, at home, would it be like a power outage or something like that? Yeah, so uh, built into Lightning, uh, you essentially have where well, it's customizable, but normally you have around 48 hours uh, to broadcast the justice transaction. So if you have a power cut for longer than 48 hours, it might be a problem. Uh, but again, there's this concept of a watchtower. So what you can do is give your justice transactions to other people that you trust who can broadcast them on your behalf uh, if the problem ever arises. So it could be a problem, but you know, only if your power outage lasts longer than 48 hours and you don't have any friends who can help you out with it. So I think it will be okay. So just want to offer a uh, an response to the early adopter channel opening costs question, which is out. Uh, as an early adopter, you can open channels optimistically because it's uh, you can leave the channels open for as long as you want. So you can just open it up, cost one transaction. There's no loss relative to direct on-chain payment, and then leave it open. And it's only in the pessimistic case that you end up paying twice for transaction fees and never do any further payments. So, which is particularly low outcome, unlike the outcome given a richly connected network and the, the future, the prospective future of this uh, network. Are there any more questions? Okay, uh, just a simple question. Do you support unidirectional channels? Or only by? Unidirectional channels? Yeah, 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 they're bi-directional, yeah. Uh, well, no, but it's a setup, the setup requires, do you do a full setup for bi-directional, or do you support Oh, them? I see, yeah, so we, we only do single funder at the moment, so um, you can't both contribute coins towards the channel, okay. it's one person who funds the channel. Yeah. Curious what uh, you're seeing as far as performance goes as the number of open channels goes up on a node. Does it increase the load on the Lightning node itself? Uh, I guess with Lit, we don't have enough users to really determine that at this point. Uh, our focus at the moment has been features and stability. Um, I guess once we get to a point, once we've got multi hop and we're able to sort of put it in the hands of more people, then we'll be able to test that out. But I mean, the software is pretty performant, so I don't think realistically it will be much of a problem for most people. Are there any more questions? What? Oh. So in terms of um, privacy and accessibility of Lightning Network, say the node that's the next hop to the sender and the receiver, as long as they have the capacity to forward the transaction on to the network and to ultimately on the other end to give the money out to the receiver, do the nodes, the Lightning Network nodes, have the discretion to either accept or deny selectively, or as long as somebody comes to the node and say, I'm opening up a channel, for the amount that the, chat, the node has the capacity for, is that such discretion, or is it purely like anybody come in as long as there's capacity and you find the proper? Um, so I guess the key is that like this isn't a consensus protocol. So you as an individual can decide exactly what it is that you want to do. So if you want to put that kind of restriction on, then you definitely can, and it won't affect anyone else. So and a node that's open for incoming connections. Do they have the discretion to selectively choose with whom they want to open? Of course. Okay. Yeah. 